This lecture is brought to you by the virtual campus of the Reformed Baptist Seminary. For information on other courses or seminary programs, please contact us at info at rbseminary.org or go to our website, rbseminary.org. Psalm 105, verse 1. <clears throat> Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Proclaim His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell about all His wondrous works. Honor His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Remember the wondrous works He has done, His wonders and the judgments He has pronounced. You offspring of Abraham, His servant, Jacob's descendants, His chosen ones. Let's uh, pray together. Our great God, we bless you for this opportunity to gather like this. Uh, we thank you for common grace and the mercies you extend to us each day of homes in which to sleep and live and food and nourishment, clothing for our bodies, for um, sound minds and the ability to come here today. Uh, we thank you for the physical and uh, political freedom we have to gather like this without fear of arrest. But especially we thank you for the freedom we have that comes uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ to come into your presence and through him and because of him ask for your blessing upon our time together that as we think about this slice of history in which you were active in the lives of your servants and your churches uh, that it would profit us uh, intellectually but it would also edify us and challenge us and be a spiritual blessing and a source of spiritual nourishment. Uh, we thank you that you are the Lord of history and that history is under your sovereign control and it will uh, proceed towards the ends that you have ordained. And uh, we do pray that as we think together uh, today, tomorrow, this Saturday, about uh, certain areas of that history, that you would be glorified. And we ask these mercies for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, then, let me uh, turn your attention to the syllabus. Um, there's a picture there on the front uh, cover. Um, it's a, a 19th century uh, portrait. Um, and all of those figures there, and this actually is on the uh, cover of the, in the background here, of the um, uh, cover of the pamphlet. Um, all of those figures there were never together in the same place at one time. Uh, their dates range over a period of time, mid uh, 17th, mid 18th century through to mid 19th century. It's about 100 years represented there. And the picture was drawn up. It was one of many uh, composite pictures that uh, various Christian groups would do in the 19th century. And I'm sure maybe some of you have seen other composite pictures like this. Uh, I know the Methodists did such things. For instance, they'd have uh, the Wesley brothers at the center of a large circle of men who would represent the various Methodist preachers. All of these men are particular Baptists, and a number of them will be, uh, well, all of these men are particular Baptists except for two. Uh, there's uh, J.G. Pike, he's at the back, um, a third from the right, and uh, next to him at the back, well, uh, fifth from the, uh, th from the uh, right at the back, uh, you, you can't see it very clearly, is a wig, is a man named Dan Taylor. But all of the others are particular Baptists. Those two men are general Baptists. And probably when the portrait was done in the 1850s, I think it's 1850s, um, <clears throat> if it was a bit later than the 1850s, they might have included somebody like Spurgeon, who by that point was becoming very well known. Um, I think already there in the 1850s, you've got this idea that maybe we can bring together these two streams of Baptist life. I'm gonna mention them very briefly at the beginning of the first lecture. Uh, general Baptists who are committed to a general redemption, broadly Arminian, and then the particular Baptists obviously who are Calvinistic. And those two groups would come together in the 1880s, 1890s in what's called the Baptist Union in England. And I suspect that the author of this is already kind of thinking along those lines. 
But I use the picture because it does draw attention to some of the key figures that we want to think about. Um, on the far right, standing at the back, is Samuel Pierce. Um, he is, uh, really becomes the kind of model of missionary piety. He, he's dead at 33. Um, his memoirs by Andrew Fuller are really kind of an, a bestseller in the 19th century. Uh, something takes place around uh, 1900, broadly speaking, in Baptist life. And a lot of what had been part of the ethos of Baptist thinking, and I'm, thinking, I'm talking here about Calvinistic, particular Baptist thinking, uh, changes. And it's circa 1900. And so the hymnody uh, of the past, so the hymns of Anne Steele and Benjamin Bedham, which every particular Baptist would have known in the 19th century, suddenly virtually disappear from Baptist hymnals. And um, uh, a number of the key figures, like Samuel Pierce, who would have been well known, would have been well known to every Baptist congregation, uh, his life uh, encapsulated in the memoirs that were written by Andrew Fuller, uh, went through multiple editions, even more printings on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, suddenly, he, by the mid-20th century, he's a completely unknown figure. Um, next to him is a man named William Stedman. I'm not going to talk about Stedman in these lectures. Um, they, were, they were close friends. Whoever, knew, whoever port, did this portrait uh, knew the relationships between these men because he has placed Stedman next to to uh, uh, Pierce. They went to school together. They went to B Bristol, Bristol Baptist College together. Uh, Stedman would live uh, 50 years beyond uh, Pierce's life and would become a key figure in Northern England. He founds uh, really what is known as a Rawdon Baptist College or Northern Baptist College. It ex still exists today in a very, very attenuated form, uh, probably liberal. Um, there has been some renewal of evangelicalism in the Baptist Union in England in, since the 60s, but I suspect it's, it's liberal. Sitting in front of them, uh, seated, the far two figures seated on the right, uh, are a man named John Foster. He's on the extreme right seated. Um, again, I'm not going to go into Foster. Uh, Foster was very well known as a man of letters. Uh, he had two or three pastorates, completely failed as a pastor um, in terms of uh, the giftings that that called upon. Uh, he just didn't have them. But he was a brilliant author in many, many ways. And his letters were known, uh, essays, really, what he would write. And they were very well known in his day. Again, virtually unknown in the 20th century. Uh, and beside him is a very important figure, Andrew Fuller, um, who is seated, seated there. <clears throat> And we will talk about Andrew Fuller, so I'm not going to uh, preempt my uh, talks, uh, which will be tomorrow on Andrew Fuller, by saying much about him. Um, he's one of those rare figures in the history of the church who has a movement named after him, Fullerism. And um, probably to all most intense, uh, most Calvinistic, Reformed Baptists today are Fullerite in uh, their thinking about certain key areas, particularly the free offer of the gospel and the passion for missions, uh, a rich evangelical Calvinism. But we'll say more about Fuller uh, as the time goes on. Uh, standing, uh, the most prominent figure standing, and the picture doesn't give this clear justice, the way it's being reproduced, but the most prominent figure in this is Robert Hall. And he's the man standing to the left of Fuller, Robert Hall Jr. Um, he was a celebrity in his day. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, in recent days, a lot of discussion, well, some discussion on the internet, that sort of thing about celebrityism and celebrities. Uh, the truth of the matter is that there's this whole penchant or, or uh, le leaning towards creating celebrities is as old as the scriptures. You know, 1 Corinthians, you know, some of you say you're of Paul, some of Paulus. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a the human tendency to create celebrities. And uh, I have a good friend, Carl Truman, uh, who has complained about how Americans particularly create celebrities. Carl's from the UK. But the reality is the British did it before. <laughs> the Americans ever did it. 
And um, you have George Whitfield, he was a celebrity. Uh, and uh, Charles Spurgeon was a celebrity. I mean, during Spurgeon's lifetime, uh, if you went to London, there were three things you had to see. You had to see Buckingham Palace, uh, Westminster Abbey, and you had to go to the Met Tab uh, to hear the remarkable or, uh, oratory of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Before Spurgeon, it was Robert Hall Jr. And uh, if Spurgeon had not exist, uh, had his ministry, uh, we'd remember Hall, Robert Hall Jr. as the great Baptist orator of his day. Um, again, I'm not going to go into him much. Um, he'll come up and mention a couple of places. Um, he is a very, very important figure. My uh, story of Baptist life that we're going to pursue really goes up to uh, the early 19th century, the 1820s is where I conclude. Um, uh, it's what's called the, uh, the end of the long 18th century, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> Robert Ault Jr., I'm increasingly convinced, is a very important figure in the decline of a robust Calvinism. Um, He's raised in a deeply Calvinistic home. His father, Robert Hall Sr., is a very, very important influence on William Carey. But he doesn't, he doesn't carry on those, uh, the, the richness of his father's thinking in a couple of areas. And one of them is his understanding of the cross. And uh, you read through his writings. Uh, he's solidly orthodox. But it's never clear if he is committed to particular redemption. That's just not clear. And people who listened to him never knew on that issue where he stood. And uh, he almost definitely had moved away from particular redemption, had, had basically given it up, and had embraced some sort of notion of general redemption, um, in which he was trying to couple together some sort of kind of quasi-Calvinism slash Arminian system. And the reality is that probably particular redemption wasn't important to him in his mind. And that that which had been central to the Baptists, because they were called particular Baptists, and they didn't call themselves, they, and that's, that's the nomenclature they use. Uh, nomenclature is important. Uh, they sometimes called themselves Calvinistic Baptists, but particular Baptist was the known nomenclature. They used it, people used it of them, and particular Baptist meant particular redemption. And here is Hall within that body of churches, and that's really not important to him. It really probably is not important to him. And uh, when Spurgeon comes along in the 1850s, 1860s, one of the things that he will notice is that the, here is this denominational body of which he is a part, and some of those core convictions of Calvinism really are not in evidence at all. And the question then is, what, what has happened between the lives of men of, like William Carey, Andrew Fuller, and Spurgeon, about a 40-year uh, period? And Robert Hall Jr. is a key figure. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into that. If we had uh, the time to go into the 19th century and look at Spurgeon, then I would have to treat uh, the decline of Calvinism among particular Baptists, but I'm not going to be looking at that. Um, <clears throat> the other three figures seated in the front there, um, uh, next, to, full, next to, to the left of Robert Hall, that's John Ryland Jr., um, Andrew Fuller's closest friend. Uh, Samuel Pierce was a very close friend, but and John Ryland Jr. was a close friend all of his life. John Ryland Jr. wrote his bi uh, Fuller's biography. And uh, I will talk a little bit about Fuller's friendship with Ryland because I think it's instructive for us uh, today. I think one of the great challenges uh, for us as we think about the Christian life um, is this failure of, especially among leaders in churches, to have deep robust friendships. And um, Fuller was blessed with both the ability to, to create deep friendships. Um, so William Carey's first words that he wrote in a letter back to England when he heard of Fuller's death 
Um, six months after Fuller had died in 1815, in May of 1815, uh, Carey received a letter in Serampore in India in December. He wrote back to England. That letter wouldn't have got back to England until a year now after Fuller's death. Uh, but Carey, almost the first words he says was, I loved him. And um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about that. And Ryland, Ryland and, and Fuller have a remarkably close friendship, despite the fact that they disagree on the most um, volatile theological issue uh, that particular Baptists wrestled with in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And that is, what is the relationship in a local church between believer's baptism and communion, or the Lord's Supper? And uh, Fuller is committed, as most particular Baptists had been historically, to close communion and close membership. Obviously, close membership. You have to be a baptized believer uh, to belong to the church and to be able to give a testimony of conversion before the church. And then that would uh, be uh, linked to your baptism as a believer. And only, bapti only baptized believers could partake of the Lord's Supper. And um, he's closed communion then. Uh, Ryland is open communion. You do not have to be baptized as a believer to partake of the table. You have to be walking in communion with the Lord, but you don't have to be baptized as a believer. And he is open membership. So he has a deacon in his church. Uh, he's six years a deacon before he's baptized as a believer. Uh, Fuller would never have had that, wouldn't have tolerated it, would see it, feel it as an undermining of Baptist polity. This is the most volatile issue among Baptists at the time. Baptists had not been able to resolve it all the way back to the 1689 Confession. It dogged them all the way through the 19th century. Eventually, after Fuller's death, a group of Baptists will split off from the mainstream of particular Baptists, and they will be known as strict and particular Baptists. Uh, nobody uses that term today in Baptist life in England. They're mostly the, what we call the Grace Baptists in England today. Um, that's one group. And there's another group uh, who are known as the uh, Gadsby uh, kind of Baptists, and uh, they're probably hyper-Calvinists. But strict, um, strict communion, uh, only allowing baptized believers to partake of the table, is a hallmark of both, both those groups. And these men had the closest of friendships. So it's, it's, it's a, I think, a, again, a very instructive point that there are areas in which we can disagree with brothers and sisters and yet maintain warm, deeply warm, fraternal relations and working together. And, that's, and I think that's very significant. Uh, besides, um, uh, I'm not going to go through all of the people in detail in the picture. It's a fascinating picture. Besides, uh, to the left of Ryland is Joseph Kinghorn. Uh, that is interesting because Joseph Kinghorn is the main protagonist for closed communion, closed membership uh, against Ryland <laughs> and also against uh, Robert Hall Jr. Robert Hall Jr. was an ardent advocate of open membership and open communion. And Joseph Kinghorn was a very strong proponent against both of those. Very learned man. Uh, I have a PhD student who's doing his doctoral work on Kinghorn. I'm really thrilled by that because Kinghorn is a, a long forgotten figure who should be remembered much by us. Uh, to his uh, left, so at the far left seated is William Carey. And we'll talk about Carey, so I don't need to say more about him. And bes behind him, um, the two figures uh, from the left working towards the right are Joshua Marshman and William Ward. As I said, whoever did this portrait knew exactly how to position people because Carey, Marshman, and Ward were the Serampore trio. These were the three men whom God led to India, uh, Carey going in 1793, uh, Ward and Marshman arriving in 1800, uh, working together from Serampore, uh, undivided, uh, in any way, shape, or form, um, uh, until the death of Ward in 1823, Carey's death in 1834, and then Marshman's death in 1837. And they become known as the Serampore Trio. And it was Thomas Chalmers, I think, the great Presbyterian theologian, who on one occasion described the Serampore Trio as one of the glories of Britain. Um, uh, somewhere around 45% 
of new translations of the Bible between 1800 and 1830 uh, were being done at Serampore. 45% of various translations of the Bible into various languages. Um, Carey and Marshman Award are involved in about probably translations into about 30 different languages in the subcontinent of India. Uh, Marshman even learns Chinese. To, he, never, he never meets anybody who's Chinese. He teaches himself uh, written Chinese to translate the Bible into Chinese. A full translation made. It was never, ever used. But uh, you get some idea of the passion of these men for the spread of the gospel. And they're, they're very critical figures. And uh, uh, we'll see how Fuller and his friends like Ryland and Pierce are linked with that. Um, the globalization of Christianity is right here. Uh, but, but up until the 1790s, 1800, Christianity was basically in two locales, one in Western Europe, evangelical Christianity, Western Europe, and the, the, the uh, Atlantic seaboard of America. And that's it. And what we've seen in the last 200 years is this massive explosion of, global, of globalization of Christianity. Uh, I know that term can be used in other contexts. I'm not using it in an economic context. Uh, so don't, don't get put off by the term if you've got political or economic reasons why the term is d disturbing to you. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way in which the gospel, as our Lord intended, has been diffused throughout the earth. And the heart of that is uh, Carey and, F and uh, Fuller and Marshman Ward. And then the three men next to him, um, William Nibb, um, uh, James Philippo, I'm not going to talk about these men in detail, and uh, Thomas Burchell, Philippo, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-P-O, uh, uh, Burchell, B-U-R-C-H-E-L-L. Uh, William Nib, with two Bs, was known as Nib the Notorious. He was a Baptist minister in Jamaica, horrified by the, what he saw in Jamaica in terms of slavery, and uh, was the critical figure that God used to end uh, slavery in the British Empire in the mid-1830s. Um, frequently told to keep his mouth shut when he came back to Britain, insisted on bringing back physical evidence, namely chains and various other implements that were used on those plantations in Jamaica, uh, to demonstrate to the English Baptists that their involvement in the various products of Jamaica, things like sugar, was an involvement in blood. And uh, uh, William Nibbs' uh, passion in this regard had been preceded by people like William Carey, when William Carey, in his inquiry into the obligation of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathen, that's the exact title, uh, a, a plea for missions. Near the end of it, when he's, he's looking at two, what are two practical things we can do? Number one, we can pray, pray together that God would send missionaries. Number two, we can give money uh, to a, 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 a group, which will become called, called the Baptist Missionary Society, uh, that will select missionaries. And where are you going to get that money? He says, give up sugar. It will save you a penny a day, and besides, it's bought with blood. And um, one of the, I think one of the very important things is you see how these, 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 these men were deeply involved, obviously, in gospel proclamation, but they recognize that gospel proclamation has consequences. It's lived out in our world. And uh, so I'm not going to get into looking at uh, Nib, Burchell, and Filippo that dealt with the abolition of slavery, but I will deal with the abolition of the slave trade. They're two separate things. And um, I'm not going to get into, or, 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 or also I'm not going to get into, why is it the English particular Baptists were able to divest themselves of this horrific abomination, but American Baptists were not. Uh, men who held the same theological convictions in terms of Calvinism, they were not able to divest themselves and with, with significant ongoing consequences for America. Um, that's a very, very important question, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, 
Uh, not formally, if you can ask me a question about it, and I can give some opinions, but I'm not going to get into it formally. Anyway, that's just an idea of why I chose the portrait. Um, very important, though, uh, you can't see this. On the back of the wall, very indistinctly, there are actually three portraits. And um, if you were to go online and, and see it more clearly, um, they are 17th century portraits. And whoever did this, again, is reminding the viewer that behind the 18th century Baptists stand the 17th century. And these men are a part of a tradition. They're building upon uh, what was done in the 17th century. And I'm, I'm thrilled that in the last uh, 50, 60 years, since the, since the 1960s, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, but also in other parts of the English-speaking world, and then... Um, uh, obviously branching out into other areas of the world, but in the English-speaking world particularly, uh, there has been a recovery of the theology, the ethos, the spirituality of this particular group of, of Baptists. I'm biased, I'm very biased, so you need to know that, uh, that uh, in my thinking about this particular body of churches, this particular body of men and women, um, uh, God knows whether or not particular Baptists in this period of time, and even today in terms of the recovery, whether we're the most faithful of New Testament people. Uh, God knows that, and that's really hidden to Him. But if there's any group of people with which I can identify uh, in the history of the church, and um, my study of Baptist history, I didn't begin there. I began with the fathers, the early church fathers, uh, fourth century, people like Basil of, Athen uh, Basil of Caesarea, Athanasius. There are battles for the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, but over the years, as I've branched out and studied other areas, um, uh, th this group came to my purview and attention somewhere in the mid-1980s. And uh, over the years, these men and women are the people with whom I feel the most affinity. Uh, of course we love others, you know, we, we love, we love uh, uh, Charles Wesley, his hymnody, uh, we love Whitfield, we love uh, Edwards, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're all 18th century, I should take some others back, you know, Owen and uh, Calvin. But there are, always, there are always areas where we, we find a degree of disagreement and uh, so, you know, working through the life of Calvin, you hit, you know, Michael Cervantes. And so what do you do with that? And um, uh, I, I was recently just doing a lecture on a woman named Brilliana Harley, a very, very obscure Puritan woman. Um, her father, uh, who was the governor of a Dutch town called Brill, thought it'd be brilliant, no pun intended, to name his daughter Brilliana after the town where she was born. And a um, uh, very strong Puritan. She marries a man named Robert Harley. And at some point in their career, Robert Harley is appointed by Parliament in 1643 to head up the commission for the demolition of objects of superstition and idolatry. That was the actual name of the commission. The commission for the demolition of objects of superstition and idolatry, which meant he had to go around London with a bunch of friends with axes to destroy all the crosses, any crucifixes they came across. They wouldn't have come across many crucifixes, but uh, uh, crosses a lot. Uh, defacing any picture of any of the saints, particularly Mary, and any d images of God. And um, from a point of view of Baptist thinking about relationship of church and state, there's an element of problem there. Uh, and I, I, I actually posted a little thing on inter the internet, a friend of mine, uh, pushed back, and he said, oh, you know, well, what does God say about idolatry in the Old Testament? Yes, I said, but you never get, there's nary a word, where to flee idolatry, 1 John 5, but nary a word that we need to have a committee like this in our church that should go around other neighboring churches and chopping down, you know, statues of Mary, whatever. And so I love, I, I've grown to appreciate Brilliana Harley, uh, she really is a remarkable Christian woman. Her letters to her son when he went up to Oxford, she's got about, 300, about 200 of them. Absolutely incredible letters of a Puritan mother to a son. 
hoping that he would walk in the ways of faith, which he did. Uh, just an absolute gem. Uh, on, I don't even know how I came across her about a year ago. Um, that's one of the glories, I think, of the internet. You know, there's a lot of bad things about the internet. One of the glories of the internet is you find stuff you, I, I never knew this woman existed. Um, but you also, there's these areas where you've got a disagreement. Uh, and um, these, these, this community, so I'm biased. This community is, if there's any period of time, and I used to do this when I was very young. I've always loved history. You know, I'd love to have lived then, not now. You know, as a young boy, it's, you know, with the knights of the Middle Ages or the, you know, back in Greece and Rome. And I still sometimes have that, though. You know, the, the boy is still there and the man. And um, if there's any period I would have loved to go back to, it'd be this period. I'd love to sit in on some of those prayer meetings that these men and women had uh, praying for revival and the spread of the gospel or to sit in on some of the ministerials, or to be there in October of 1792 with 13 men crammed into a small room who decide on the basis of probably what is today about $1,000 to form a missionary society to go cross-cultural. I mean, what would it like to have been there? Um, anyway. So, I am biased, and so you need to know I'm, I'm coming from that bias. Uh, every historian's biased. Um, we, uh, there are two horizons in history, right? There is the horizon of the texts and the facts, and then there's the, the horizon of the historian. And uh, we come with our questions. So, for instance, one of the texts we're going to look at this uh, few days is a text uh, uh, by Andrew Fuller on the promise of the Spirit for missions. And uh, years ago, when I first came across that, I was, I've always been very interested in pneumatology and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, years ago, when I came across that, I thought, I'd be fabulous to reproduce this. I, you know, and I thought, where? Well, I, I wrote to the Banner of Truth, and this is 1986 or 7, 87, I think. And I said, I, I've got a text, and I, I'll introduce it and send it to you. And they, they described that uh, Ian Murray said he would print it. Uh, but as I came to the last page and a half, it had to do with eschatology where Fuller is talking about where we are in time in the book of Revelation. I thought, this is really not that important. Uh, to be honest, I'm a product of a reaction against all those, you know, those dispensational time charts. Uh, that was a generation before me. Uh, I, I, I look at them now. They're interesting historical artifacts, but I find them kind of hokey, some of the things that they, you know, they lay out. Uh, I'm not a dispensationalist, obviously, uh, not pre-mill, definitely not pre-trib. Uh, and um, again, I think like, this is off to the side, like a lot of my generation, it, it didn't really click with me and it took me a long time. I was in my 40s before I finally decided I really should figure out what I do believe about the millennium. I knew what I didn't believe. I never bought the pre-mill, pre-trib stuff. And so I'm somewhere around an optimistic R mill. If you know G.K. Beale in his treatment of Revelation, that's probably where I fall. Optimistic because I, have, I think God's got plans for Israel. I, I've got a Puritan hope. Uh, you can disagree radically with me. That's fine. Um, but I, 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 was, I was wrong because I thought, this is really not that interesting. It's not interesting to me. That's the problem. And so I left it off. And I said it to uh, Ian Murray, and they printed it without the last page and a half, because it was all eschatology. And I thought, it's really not that important. Well, the more I got to know Fuller, I realized it is very important to him. And who cares what I thought? I needed to be faithful in trying to reproduce that. And that's a good example of the way in which a historian brings his horizon to the text. And thankfully, there's always the text or the facts, to challenge the reading of the historian. So if you get it wrong, somebody else, thankfully, can come along and say, no, no, you're not reading that right. You're allowing your questions to shape your reading. Anyway, all of that is by way of introduction. Very quickly, uh, the course description um, is there on page two. Um, my name, my email address, uh, some of those of you who are taking for credit, 
Uh, we'll need that um, as we get into the delivery of assignments. Uh, if you've got problems with, with assignments, please don't feel, feel free to email me. And obviously I'm giving it to all of you, so uh, don't abuse it, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, one of the things I think the internet has done is opened this up. Uh, I can't imagine what people like my, my president, Dr. Moeller, the amount of correspondence he gets through email. Um, but I know I get people write to me, and I do honestly try to a answer questions, but we all have limited time. And uh, so I'm, I'm, but I'm happy to answer questions if at the end of the course, you, you know, what do you think about that? And whatever. Um, every good historian, every Christian ought to be a good historian. That's Caleb Evans. Uh, Caleb Evans is not in that picture. Again, another remarkable Baptist, Baptist figure uh, in the 18th century, the president of uh, Bristol Baptist Academy, the only Baptist Academy in um, England to train ministers for the gospel in the 19th, 18th century, up until 1800, roughly. Uh, the oldest Baptist school in the world. Today, it's nowhere near where it was theologically then. Um, predates uh, uh, Brown University, which is the oldest Baptist institution on this side of the Atlantic, which was 1764. Predates it by about 100 years. Well, about 80 years in its founding, but actually really started going in the 1720s. Uh, uh, then something about the dates and there. The course description of the course is a detailed study of the theology and piety of the English particular Baptist community from their origins in the 1630s to the 1830s. I'm looking at some key themes. I'm looking at the Doctrine of Trinity. Uh, thankfully, in the last 40, 50 years, we've had a recovery of the Doctrine of Trinity. Um, I think one of the key reasons for the lack of emphasis on the Trinity in the 20th century was the fundamentalist controversy. And uh, it wasn't felt by fundamentalists in the 20s that this was something critical to hand on. And uh, I hope this is not true, but uh, often I will take uh, a poll among my students. I'll do Church History 1. I've got 100, 120 students in there. I'll ask them, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on the Trinity? And I might get five people. And uh, average age in there might be 25 to 35. I'm not good at math, and so I have to do a very round figure, you know. Okay, so most of you have been in church, a lot of you, let's say you've been in church since you were 10 or 5, and granted, let's, let's say start at 10 because, you know, how much they would have understood before then, uh, how many sermons have you heard? You heard, let's say, that's at a minimum one a week. And we do the numbers, and it's disturbing. And uh, that, that has changed. And there, I, I, again, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but in the last two or three years, there was a huge brouhaha on the Internet about the Trinity, uh, how evangelicals view it. And I think I was thankful. Um, um, probably a number of years ago, uh, ever since I, became, I was involved in any form of really ministry since the uh, early 80s, our focus has been gender issues. Women in ministry, then homosexuality, now transgenderism. Frankly, I'm fed up with it. Fed up with the whole, the whole debate. Um, and I remember saying to the class once, somewhere around probably about five years ago, I, I really wish we were back in the fourth century and fighting about the Trinity. You know, I, you know when, you, when Gregory and Nyssa would go get his hair cut, and the guy's cutting his hair, he'd say, Now, tell me, is the Son eternally generated from the Father? And how would you prove that? You know, man, I wish those were the debates around the gender issues. I'm, the problem is you can't choose the issues. We have to fight on the gender issues, and that has to be the focus of our battles. Nobody in this room is going to go to prison for your belief in the Trinity. You may end up... I, I, I'm not trying to be melodramatic here. There may be, we may end up, some of us, in prison for how we, what we believe about trans, transgenderism. That's not, it's not, now it's, it's a horrifying thing, but it's not completely beyond the pale. But nobody is ever going to be taken to prison because you believe in the eternal generation of the Son. Um, and, uh, but I'm thankful, I was thankful for that blow up in about two years ago because I thought something at least to talk about instead of gender. And uh, 
It is amazing to me that we as evangelicals have not focused on really the most important thing uh, to the faith, which is that our God is a triune being. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who share fully one being, and yet they are three. And uh, it's our great difference with Muslims, with uh, Mormons, with Jehovah's Witnesses. It is the heart of the faith. If the Lord Jesus Christ be not fully God, we're still in our sins. If the Holy Spirit be not fully God and a person, we're still in our sins. And uh, we, for some reason, we, we assumed during the 20th century, well, everybody believes this in our circles, and we, we never taught it. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk about confessions. Um, in the 19th century, there grew up this idea that uh, we don't need confessions. The, the Bible alone is my confession. Um, and um, that created all kinds of problems. Uh, that starts to move, emerge in the 1820s, 1830s, at the very tail end of the Second Great Awakening. Usually Charles Finney is identified with that, but I think it's broader than Finney. Although it's very interesting that all of the problem movements of the 19th century, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians, they all come from upstate New York, Albany, Rochester, that area known as the Burned Over District. And uh, again, studies have been done why that is so. Um, and um, all of them are against confessions, really. And um, Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Bible. And so the importance of confessions, they cannot replace the Bible. Of course, we know that. But they are essential uh, to the maintenance of community and church faithfulness. Uh, the centrality of the scriptures, uh, conversionism, baptism, Lord's Supper, and then prayer, praying for revival, and the emergence of the modern missionary movement. So I'm really doing two things. I'm looking at the movement in terms of its history, its chronology. I'm looking at figures, but I'm also looking at themes as I interweave these various figures. Uh, three things I would like you to come away from this time together. One is to help you read and understand English particular Baptist texts in their historical and cultural matrix. Um, you have to know something about the larger picture to understand what's going on, why th certain things are being emphasized. So I want to give you an idea of the larger history. Um, secondly, to give you uh, an awareness of and sensitivity to the richness and depth of theological thought and spiritual life to be found in this heritage. Um, I find it deeply frustrating by, I'm deeply frustrated by evangelicals, generally not people who would argue that they're Calvinistic Baptists, but evangelicals who feel we have no history, and they have, we have to go to Rome, or Constantinople, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy, or Canterbury, Anglicanism, uh, to get that history. And um, thankfully, uh, there aren't tons and tons of people like this, but you, you encounter them. I remember being asked to speak to somebody who was raised in a Southern Baptist context who was beginning to think, well, actually, they weren't beginning, they were planning to join uh, uh, an Eastern Orthodox community. And uh, part of their concern was, well, we really, we, we, there's no depth here. And there is a richness here. And... Uh, it hasn't been taught. That's the problem. And then finally, I, I really would hope that the student will engage, your, your, all of you will engage to some degree in, I use the French word there, ressourcement. Um, it's a very difficult word to translate into English. It's got the idea of going back to the past to retrieve something that is of value to the present. So retrieval maybe is the best word. Uh, but you're going to have to add a few words. Retrieval from the past for the present. Uh, the word, you know, uh, I'm sure some of you speak other languages than English. And uh, when you're translating from English into another language or vice versa, there are words you just can't, you can't capture them in one word. Uh, Resourcement coming from French and English, it, it just can't be captured. You have to have a whole sentence for it. The retrieval from the past of riches for the present. And um, I'll be honest, uh, when I first came across Andrew Fuller in 1985, I think it was 85, might have been 84, but 85 is the date I have in my mind, um, 
I was in a, a library, I was teaching in a sem seminary in, in Ontario, Central Baptist Seminary, and I'd been asked to teach Baptist history. I knew nothing really about Baptist history because I mentioned earlier that I'd focused on the early church. And um, this particular summer, it was the summer of either 85 or 84, I have a, a strange habit. If I've got free time, uh, I like going through libraries. If I'm in a library building, and I'll just go down a, an aisle, I haven't been down for a while, and pull books off at random. It's, I know it's bizarre, but anyway. And I found some, I, there is a gem I'll, I'll share when we get to Samuel Pierce that I found um, in this, with this weird habit. And I, I saw these three volumes, 1845 as they turned out, they were printed by the American Baptist uh, uh, Sunday School Society. No, American Baptist Publication Society. Uh, found, it was in Philadelphia. And it was the Northern Baptists uh, who printed them and they were the works of Andrew Fuller. I knew nothing about Andrew Fuller, never heard of him. I'd never heard of him. And I pulled the third volume down, and I opened it, and at ra it just fell open uh, uh, at random. And it was the text I mentioned earlier, The Promise of the Spirit uh, for Missions. Now, I had, when I was converted in the 1970s that our brother mentioned, uh, my first Christian experience was a dual Baptist I was converted in a Baptist church, Evangelical Baptist church, a very good church in many ways. But the pastor was becoming charismatic. In fact, he tried to lead the church into the vineyard. It didn't happen, but that's where he ended up trying to go. And so I was, in, I was influenced by charismatics. And I used to go to a charismatic meeting on every Friday night. And for about four years, if you'd asked me, I, I was a charismatic. And uh, by the early 80s, I was starting to read and had become reformed. Partly, a number of reasons. Number one, I had an uncle-in-law, my mother-in-law's brother, Stanley Berry. I don't expect anybody knows him here. You mention him to any people like Ian Murray, Eric Alexander, they all knew him. He had this bookstore in Glasgow where he sold reformed literature. And he was the bookstore. And Stanley Berry would send reform books, Banner Truth books, over to my mother-in-law. She's Arminian. And she got no use of them, so she'd give them to me. And I can remember, we didn't have a shower in our house, but I remember reading these books in my bathtub until the water was tepid and cold, and, you know. And by the, year, by the, by the early 80s, uh, that had been a, ma a major influence in shifting me from being charismatic. And then I had students in my classes, my history classes, and they'd ask me questions I couldn't answer. The, the guy who'd be the church historian before I was was reformed, and he'd caused, caused quite a stir in the school. And these students had braced it, and they'd ask me questions, and I couldn't answer them. And so I was starting to shift. And by, by 85, I was, I was a five-point Calvinist. But still, always very interested in the work of the Spirit. And so as soon as it opened, I thought, wow, what's this about? And I was hooked. And Andrew Fuller has changed my life. And I don't believe everything he believed, and I don't believe everything he believed because he believed it. Uh, I believe it because I think it's biblical. But he's changed my life. I, I, he's, uh, these, these men, to me, are friends. They, they are people who have been mentors to me. And I hope you'll have something like that. You'll, some of these people, yeah, I'm interested in learning more about them. Uh, two books, texts. One is The Armies of the Lamb. We'll explain what that is useful for in a second. And then uh, the other are various texts I've given you online that you'll need. That's what that is. The most exalted by life and thought of the English particular Baptist community. That's simply a group of texts. I just, that's, I didn't want to put a group of texts. So I put, that's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a little book, but it's an online book of primary sources. So we're going to meet three days uh, today, obviously. Tomorrow and Saturday, we start at 9. Uh, I, I apologize for starting late this morning. We start at 10. My wife and I got picked up yesterday morning uh, from our home near Toronto at 3 in the morning. My wife hadn't slept at all. Um, I think I had an hour of sleep. Uh, I slept a little bit on the plane. We got here at 9 o'clock. I don't know why I booked the flight so early. Uh, I think because I wanted a whole day in another whole day in Fort Lauderdale. And the uh, result was we didn't sleep all day, and I was, anyway, 
I, I just realized it was going to be difficult getting up this morning uh, for me. Anyway, so that's why we started at 10. But tomorrow we start at 9 and also Saturday. And then there are appropriate breaks. And I'll be having a break in a minute. Uh, and I'm already behind one, one hour, but we'll make that up uh, in a, in, uh, as, the day, as the times go on. Seven major written assignments. Uh, the due date for those is April 30th. I'm flexible on this. Uh, I mean, if there are reasons why you cannot meet that date, those of you who are taking for credit, that's fine. Um, I've actually asked you to mail them to me in a hard copy. I'm going to actually change that. Um, e just to email them to me, okay? That's e easier for you. My email address is there. Um, mail coming to Canada. I, I don't know what happens at that border. It's bizarre. Uh, stuff can be sent from the States, and uh, you might have problems with your mail system. I think it's brilliant compared to the Canadian mail system. Um, stuff hits that border, and it stays in Buffalo for like a week. I don't know what they're doing with it, but so uh, please just email it to me, and uh, uh, that'll be the easiest. And if you have problems, please notify me ahead of time that I'm not going to be able to get the assignment in on time. Those are 82% of the final mark. They are found uh, pages five and following. Um, some of them are kind of essay questions. So the first one is to read the entirety of the first and second London Confessions of Faith. And to write on three things. One is the Trinity. Second is law and gospel. Third is a topic you're interested in. And um, please read the entirety. You may think, oh, okay, the Trinity, that's found, Second London Confession, uh, certain chapter, that's all. No, no, the whole thing. Because there's going to be things said about the deity of our Lord and the Holy Spirit in there that you need to bring in. Law and gospel, again, it's, it's, it's all the way through. And then a topic of your choice. It might be, com it might be comparing, uh, for instance, the First London Confession on the Lord's Table uh, with the Second um, it might be on the nature of the church. It might be on church-state relations. Um, anyway, you're free to choose a, a third one. Um, how long should that be? Each of them, each of the question answers should be about 900 words. Okay, that's about three pages. Um, the second assignment, I've got specific a text I want you to read. It's really on John Gill. Um, I've chosen some interesting texts, the ones that you wouldn't expect, uh, and I'm, I'm, that's the purpose of that. Usually Gill gets caught up, brought up, oh, he's the hyper-Calvinist. Um, uh, I will talk about hyper-Calvinism. I don't like that term. I usually talk about high Calvinism. Um, I think Gill has tendencies. He believes in eternal justification. I think that's a problem. But I think we've written off Gill all far too easily. Um, when I, whenever I prepare, and I don't do a lot of preaching, but if I prepare a message for preaching, often I will have two older commentaries, people I look at. John Calvin, he's always good. Um, so different from Martin Luther, who I love, but I, I rarely read Luther on, on uh, most things. Because he, he, you know, gets gets like me, gets caught up in all kinds of side side roads and whatever. And but Calvin is always to the point. Brevity is is great. And the other person I read is Gill. I don't always agree with Gill, but he's always helpful. He's often helpful. So, and the, my 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 perspective on Gill changed when I read the funeral sermon he gave for his twelve year old daughter Elizabeth Gill. And it was Timothy George, uh, really a great historian, uh, who's recently retired from Beeson Divinity School, who alerted me to this. I, I, I'd never known about it, and he mentions it. And um, again, I've got a PhD student doing work on Gill, and I'm thrilled. And I've encouraged him. I said, you need to make Gill your life's work. And we, need it. we need a complete critical edition of all the works of Gill. Um, there are 75 sermons, for example, over in Duke, University Library that nobody has ever looked at. Somebody was sitting on the Gill's ministry, wrote them out as he was writing, as he was preaching, and nobody ever cites them. And who knows what other gems are out there. 
Anyway, so we look at Gil. And then on the theology, I'm looking at Gil on angels. And that's another area we don't talk about either. And um, they're biblical, right? <laughs> we don't talk about it at all. And we got this proliferation of rubbish. You know, sometimes you go into Christian bookstores and it disturbs me, deeply disturbs me. All the stuff on historical fiction. I, I could use a stronger word, but I won't. And um, rows and rows of it. There's a Christian bookstore near us. And like rows and rows of historical fiction. Church history is like that. And Christian doctrine is like that. And rows and rows of historical. And I'm thinking, like, does this stuff sell? It must. Anyway. Um, and stuff on angels. But man, we, we need a robust reflection on angels because it reflects on who God is and how are angels, how, well, what does the Bible say about angels? And so uh, that little thing on John Gill. Uh, the third assignment is Ann Dutton. Uh, Ann Dutton is a, a remarkable woman. I'm going to leave more remarks till we get to her. Looking at two tracks, she wrote one on uh, baptism, one on the Lord's Supper. The one on the Lord's Supper is extraordinary. Um, she retains uh, what every Baptist, particular Baptist, retained up until roughly 1800, and that is that the Lord's table is a place where we encounter the living God. And our Lord Jesus is there, present at the table by his Spirit. Not physically, of course not physically. In other words, she's, a, she's Calvinistic in her thinking about the table. This is John Calvin's view of the table. Um, and then we look at a pastor, Benjamin Bedham. Uh, one of my great heroes, 55 years at Little Church in Borton on the Water. I shouldn't say little. Uh, by the end of his life, there were about eight, 900 hearing him preach every Sunday. About 180 in membership. Completely opposite of the Southern Baptists. Completely opposite. Uh, in Britain, to be baptized as a believer could be a harrowing experience. Always done outdoors. And the whole community knew We've got the story of a baptism down at Red Ruth in Cornwall. Uh, eight people baptized on a, on, a May sun, on a May morning, about a thousand in attendance. A lot of them came to God. I mean, what are these people doing? Uh, nobody baptized by immersion. Nobody baptized believers in England. Everybody's infant baptism in a, fount, in a font. And everybody knew that when you plunge the body under water, it is dangerous for your health. I mean, that, that's what everybody knew in the 18th century. Right? Nobody took baths. They're dangerous. And uh, there is a doctor early, early seven, around 1700. He actually writes a medical treatise on why it is, it is important to occasionally have a bath in which you cover the entire body with water. Everybody wrote him off as a quack. I mean, the, the guy's obviously bonkers. And these Baptists are doing this? Anyway, so um, Benjamin Bedham, uh, great minister of the gospel. And really what I'm, I'm having you look at there is a theology of ministry. Most of the sermons there deal, that you're looking at deal with uh, ordination and what is, what is, uh, what is a, a gospel minister. And then uh, the final uh, couple of assignments, uh, one deals with Andrew Fuller. And the free offer of the gospel, a little bit about his life. And then um, uh, there's two assignments on Fuller. And then the final assignment is a summative assignment, which is, what have you learned? Whole course, three days, reading, 1,200 words. So what is, what is this all about? And so those are the seven assignments uh, that you are to prepare between now and the end of April. As I said, I'm, 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 I'm open if you, need, if you write me and say, could, could I have to the end of May? Here are the reasons why I'm, I'm flexible on that. The other 18%, and it's weird percentage, I know. Um, I felt it was needed to be more than 15. Normally, you, you, you do round kind of numbers like that, 15, 85, but anyway... It's 18% is a meditative paper on the impact of the spirituality of Andrew Fuller. And that book, Armies of the Lamb, what it is is uh, about 40 extracts from mostly his letters, none of his sermons. I don't, I don't think there's any, there's a circular letter in there, uh, but mostly his letters to people. 
Because uh, I, th I, I love letters to people. And we'll, when we get to Samuel Pierce, we'll talk about my experience of reading 75 love letters he wrote to his wife. And uh, it's, a it's absolutely fabulous. But it's a weird experience, right? You know, I, I imagine if I f phoned you up and said, I'm, I'm doing a survey of the marital life of Reformed Baptists in 21st century America. Do you think you could share with me some of your <laughs> letters to your spouse? Uh, I think you'd probably be well within your rights to say, buzz off. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a weird experience, but um, there's nothing there that I think would embarrass either of them in one sense. And they're both long in glory with Samuel Pierce, but it, they're just tremendous letters. Um, and these letters are wonderful. Letters reveal. I, I don't know what historians are going to do in the future with email. I, I mean, who writes letters to people anymore? I, I do sometimes. I have, a, I have a very good friend who was a student in, uh, at Colorado Christian University, and sometimes I write him a letter. Uh, I keep letters. I, I, I'm at the point now, it, it's files of overflowing stuff. And I, I have this idea somebody's going to come in and just pitch the whole thing. But anyway... Um, so what I've done is I've extracted these letters, and I want you to go through them and do it meditatively. I, I would suggest taking two months, take one a day, and read it, as you would do. It's not scripture, but as you would wrestle with scripture, think about well, what's Fuller saying, or what's he saying, and then what, what does it mean to me? And really, it's an ec this is an exercise in how an author of the past can shape you. That's what I'm... That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested, please note, if you're doing this for credit, I'm not interested in the spirituality of Fuller. I don't want an essay on the spirituality of Fuller. I know the spirituality of Fuller, I think. What I'm interested in is, what does it mean to you? How does it impact you? And really what I'm doing here is I'm trying to remind you that the writings we're reading are, they're, they're rich spiritually, as well as theologically, but they're rich spiritually. They're to challenge you, they're, they're to encourage you, they're to have an impact, ongoing impact on your, on your life. I mean, there are areas of my life, uh, because I've been immersed in this world uh, for so long, that lines come to me. And they, they've shaped me. They've shaped me in the way uh, I think. Um, the whole, well, good example, the whole, the whole way in which evangelicals in the last you know, four to eight, six years, uh, the whole debate about how should we view the political realm and uh, the whole issues that have surrounded. I'm not going to get into this. It's volatile about uh, the, uh, the president of the United States, et cetera, et cetera. And what has been enormously helpful has been Andrew Fuller, his thinking about his own day and how one should love one's country but also how there is a higher love, the love of the kingdom. And how, how do we relate these things? And Fuller has been enormously helpful to my thinking. And um, he lived in a day of great crisis uh, when Napoleon Bonaparte was the dictator of Europe and was threatening to invade England. And uh, Fuller preached a sermon on Christian patriotism in 1802 or 1803. Uh, what should we do? What does God expect of us who are Christians, who have a higher calling? We belong to the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, but our nation is on the verge of invasion by this man over in Europe, Napoleon. And how should, how should we respond to that? How should we respond politically? Um, I will bring in, for instance, when we look at uh, Samuel Pierce, I'll bring in uh, Pierce again. Um, he, when he prayed for the French. And you might think, oh, that's bizarre. That's, what, what, what's the big news about that? Well, to be English was not to be French. I mean, the English had defined themselves. We are not French. They hated the French. Uh, between uh, 1690 and 1815, the English and the French fought every decade a war, except for one. And it was the British victory over the French in 1759 here in North America that decisively changed this continent. 
radically changed this continent because they then brought in the Quebec Act, which was a cause of the revolution, allowing the French in Quebec to have their own law, church, and um, civil law, church, and language. And a lot of the American for whom they were British found that deeply distasteful. We fought these people for all these years and you're going to allow them this? No, no. And uh, then you read Pierce about how we should think about the French. It's remarkable. And it bears. It's helped me think about uh, in the little uh, uh, blurb that was given, uh, I was raised in an Irish Catholic home, but what was not mentioned is my father was a Muslim. My father is Kurdish from Iraq. He came to England. He married my mom, and he only married my mom on the proviso that he become a Catholic. My grandfather, Patty O'Gorman, <laughs> classic name, said to my father, no way you can marry my daughter unless you become a Catholic. So my dad became a Catholic. So I was raised in an Irish Catholic home. My father completely embraced Irish Catholicism. And if you met him today, he's got an English accent. You would never know he was born in in. Kirkuk in Kurdistan. Nobody knew where that place was prior to 2000. You know, I'd have to explain who the Kurds were. Now you don't have any. You know, places like Mosul, Erbil, uh, Fallujah, all these places were very familiar to me growing up. And uh, I've had to think through, how do I, how do I view Muslim immigrants uh, when I've got that background? And uh, what do I feel when I see somebody in a niqab and uh, the whole burqa, the whole, uh, what goes through my mind? How do I think about that? And Samuel Pierce has been enormously helpful. Because on the one hand, he emphasized, we have a right to defend our country, but we have a higher calling. And he prayed that God would take the gospel to France. So, um, um, <clears throat> my hope is that as you read the writings here of Andrew Fuller, they will have that sort of spiritual impact. So what I'm looking for is four or five pages of what is Andrew Fuller, what is reading his writings meant to you during those two months? Please note, it's not an essay on the spirituality of Fuller. It's an essay on the spirituality of Fuller for today. What does it mean for us today? And I, you don't need to do extra research. Oh, okay, read about, you know, all kinds of articles on Fuller. Uh, there's a little brief introduction in the book about who he was, and we'll obviously take some lectures on him. Okay, let me stop here. We'll have a break. Any questions before we break? Nope? Okay.